I want to welcome everybody to, uh, to this afternoon's Healthy Soil uh, for Sustainable Farmer Showcase. My name is David Lamb and I'm with the Soil Health Institute. And uh, today we're going to feature some farmers from California and they're going to be talking about the challenges and opportunities of improving soil health in what we call a dry climate. And I'm talking to them this, just a few minutes ago. I guess it is pretty dry out there as we even speak today. Uh, the Healthy Soils for Sustainable Cotton Project is a joint effort between the Soil Health Institute and uh, Wrangler uh, Jeans and the Walmart Foundation uh, providing funding for this project. A lot of you probably never heard of the Soil Health Institute and who we are, but we're a not-for-profit group uh, who's charged with the idea of safeguarding and enhancing the vitality and productivity of our nation's soil through scientific research and advancement. You know, we're seeking to, to support what we're learning and seeing producers do in the field through uh, verifying it through scientific research. Uh, funding for this project came from two private sector. Again, I mentioned the Wrangler Foundation, uh, Wrangler Jeans and the Walmart Foundation were the ones that provided funding for this uh, and made this opportunity available for the last several years. Uh, the objective of the project is twofold. One, we want to increase the adoption of soil health management systems by cotton producers across, uh, across the country. And the second part is we want to somehow quantify the benefits from an environmental and economic uh, perspective. This is the fourth one. Uh, we've had three starting uh, on February 2nd. The other three, uh, Mississippi, Texas, and Arkansas, are all available for replay. Uh, since you have registered for these events, you will get an email, and in that email, there'll be a link to where the replays are available if you have not had opportunity to participate. Also, we'll have four more coming up. Next week, we'll be visiting with the folks in, in Georgia talking about cotton, soil health, and peanuts. Uh, then we're going to be visiting with uh, some folks in North Carolina, and again, concluding uh, in South Carolina with some lessons that they've learned from eight years of regenerative ag. And the last one, we're gonna bring in some industry folks to talk about the future of cotton as it relates to soil health. But I always like to start off the presentation. This is what we're talking about, folks. We're trying to get producers to look at soil in a totally different way. The idea of soil having the continuous capacity of a soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that has sustains plants, animals, and humans. You know, the continue, the sustainability, the idea that it's a living ecosystem, there's life in the soil and functions. You know, what are those functions that, that, that are necessary to produce food and fiber? Well, we've got to cycle nutrients. We've got to let water infiltrate and we have to be able, the soil has to be able to hold on to it and release it at those times of the year when it's most necessary. We expect our soils to help to filter and buffer out agricultural inputs or pollutants that might be applied. Uh, the fourth one there, we need to be able to get across the field. So we expect our soil to be that stable platform in which we can get our uh, harvesting equipment and other type of equipment across. And the last one there, we most of us don't think about, but it provides habitat for a diversity of soil microbes, soil organisms that, that, that we see uh, kind of coming back into the system that we haven't uh, given much consideration for in past. And 90% of these, these soil functions are all mediated by the life that's in the soil. Four principles that you'll hear about, two of them, minimizing disturbance and maximizing cover. Those are there to help protect the, the soil resource, to provide habitat, to protect soil aggregates, and to add organic matter into the system. And the other two, maximizing living roots and maximizing diversity help provide for a continuous input of carbon and energy as a feedstock to provide and, and to feed and sustain a diverse microbial and soil other soil organism community there. And my last slide here before I turn it over to Jeff is, if you want to ask questions, you can do it through the Q&A. You're more than welcome to type in the questions and we'll be asking them as we go along with that. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here and turn it over to Jeff Mitchell. Uh, Jeff, Dr. Jeff Mitchell is with the University of California, Davis, and he's with the uh, conservation education specialist out there involved with the conservation agricultural systems innovate, uh, initiative, along, among a number of other things. And Jeff's been involved with soil health way longer than I have. So with Jeff, I'm going to shut up here and turn it over to you. Well, listen, uh, David uh, Lamb, thank you very, very much for the, the very wonderful and generous introduction there. 
And I also want to thank uh, the Soil Health Institute uh, for the opportunity uh, that's enabled us here in California to be part of your uh, cotton beltwide soil health uh, effort this last year or so, and to be part of this uh, showcase seminar this morning. Uh, it is, it is uh, certainly true, the, the wonderful uh, work that the Soil Health Institute is conducting. We're very proud and uh, to be part of your long-term soil health assessment, uh, over 100 sites in North America. We have two of them in California, and we really appreciate the great work that you're doing there on so many fronts that are, that are utterly important there. I'd like to welcome everyone in our audience this morning and echo the welcome of David there, not only to our local uh, folks who are tuned in from California, but also uh, around the country and indeed perhaps around the world there. We're very glad to have this opportunity to share some information and some ideas that uh, we think are exciting and important uh, that are being developed out here in California. Let me, let me uh, share with you, let me see if I can advance the slides here now. Uh, uh, let's see here, how to, I'm not sh quite sure how to do that there, but let's see. Um, let me try to do that. Shelly, if you wanna take over there and, and we can advance those slides there, maybe there. I just wanna give everyone a, a little bit, go ahead the next one there. Our plan for this morning or for this, this session here will first of all have an open panel and we have three outstanding farmers who are going to share some of their, uh, their current insights about what it's like to actually grow cotton in California. So we'll have an open panel uh, by those farmers. The next one, Shelley, if you please. Then we're going to broaden the discussion with those same farmers and we'll add uh, uh, Carrie Crum, who is a consultant and by the way, the farmers are John Texera of Lone Willow Ranch in Firebaugh, Cannon Michael of Bowles Farming in near the town of Los Banos, California, and Gary Martin associated with Picolot Farms in the small town of Mendota. All of these towns are in the central uh, San Joaquin Valley. Uh, and Kerry is also uh, based in Madera, California with his company, California Ag Solutions. And we'll talk a little bit, or they will talk about soil health management efforts that they're working on. Next one, uh, Shelly, if you please. And then we're gonna go uh, retrospectively, a little bit of history that talks, uh, Marsha Gibbs with the Sustainable Cotton Project is gonna share some of the work that uh, has gone on indeed for a long time here in cotton systems uh, related to some of these same goals. And then lastly, Shelly, we're gonna wrap it up with Rebecca Burgess, who is with Fibershed. And she's gonna talk about some very current and uh, ongoing uh, discussions to negotiate improved pricing for California cotton uh, based on some of the soil health and, and, and farm uh, performance improvement efforts that are underway. So that's our plan now. What we'd like to do is uh, get back to the live action screens here. And let's put the, the, the four the three farmers and carry on there. I'd just like to start our discussion for everyone this morning by asking each of you to share your own uh, perspectives and views about that very simple sounding question. What is it like? What does it mean to be a cotton farmer in California's uh, San Joaquin Valley in this day and age? And with that open introduction, uh, let's have at it. What, are, what, are your, what comes to mind here? Well, I'll, I'll start off by uh, how I was, got involved with cotton. And it takes me back to the late 50s when I was knee high and uh, going out to the cotton farm uh, with my dad and watching the people pick cotton by hand and putting it in a sack. And I was like, I was kind of, I think I was kind of scared. And now you go back X amount of years and now we do it with a machine and so much has happened in between and so it's kind of fascinating to see what's changed in our area and it seems to be changing uh, every season and uh, there's a lot of issues there's there's the the challenges of weather uh, the challenges of labor and the biggest challenge I think is water especially for our dry climate 
we're uh, we're maybe pushing maybe five inches of rain this winter uh and it's it's there's just not uh i was flying over the uh, sierras just the other day and there's not a whole lot of white snow there so uh, water is a big issue what we've tried to do is to increase our organic material uh our organic matter in the soil to have a better water uh, holding capacity it, it's a we can bring it up a percent we can hold maybe Twenty-five thousand more gallons per acre, which is better than nothing. Um, so those are some of the challenges. Very good, Cannon or Gary, you want to follow up? Yeah, I'd be happy to. I've been farming on this ground since the early '80s. My wife's family. Uh, at the time, they were growing a lot of cotton. They've got sugar beet history, rice history. Uh, but everything's always been irrigated. Um, we kind of evolved into an all cotton ranch for a long time. And then in the process of trying to eliminate costs, we were doing minimum till, uh, but still trying to meet with our, the compliance of the plow down law in California and San Joaquin Valley. And so we always had to do some tillage, but we sure eliminated a lot of diesel fuel, quite a bit of labor. Um, save some money with that. Um, and then we've evolved back out of all cotton to some alfalfa. Uh, we've got some wheat planted this year and then some tree crops. Uh, but still, we're, we're dependent on the, the water, whether it be delivered from the surface or well water. Um, California now has uh, eradicated the pink bollworm and so there's a new challenge in the state where we kind of have to protect that since we're not going to have the sterile release program available to bail problems out. People still need to take care of the crop, still need to protect the insects, and we have limited chemicals available more and more. And that's probably going to be our solution to a bullworm problem is chemicals and so we have to keep some of those around we need to uh, not let everything disappear from california between that i guess labor and our new overtime laws that's another big issue that we have uh, especially with the diversity of crops i mean if you're if you're monocropping it's kind of easy to, uh, to schedule labor but if you have a diversity uh, it's a challenge and so, so I think there are, there's many other challenges for us too. I'll leave it at that. Nice. All right. Cannon. Yeah, no, happy to jump in and great to be on the, on the call this morning. Uh, yeah, when I got to the farm back in 1998, there was over 1.6 million acres of cotton being grown in California. And I think uh, this year we're going to settle probably somewhere under, under 200,000 acres. So it certainly has been uh Difficult to watch uh, a lot of great people exit the uh, industry. Um, I remember serving on the seed board that we had, where we were had so many breeders uh, submitting uh, varieties for us to grow that we were turning turning uh, varieties away. And now I don't know that there's uh, probably very limited active breeding for for California specifically, which um, is a huge uh, concern. I think when people stop. Uh, innovating on uh, varieties, um, you know, you're going to see uh, long-term problems because we have some specific soil issues and, and other things that we deal with. But, um, you know, I think uh, cotton is a great crop to grow in California. It's, uh, you know, we can grow some of the finest uh, cotton with uh, the extra long staple varieties that uh, most uh, folks have uh, ended up switching to. Um, and, uh, you know, again, California is, uh, certainly leads the way in terms of regulation. So, um, you know, people looking to source uh, whatever sustainably means or these other ideas. I mean, uh, the California farmer is held to certainly very high standards, um, not only in comparison to the rest of the cotton belt, but certainly to the rest of the world in terms of environmental and uh, worker uh, protections. And so, um, you know, it's a, it's a challenge, not just with cotton, but all the crops that we grow, you know, the other, uh, other two farmers have alluded to the water challenges and, uh, just the cost of, uh, production challenges. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, California, well, I mean, I think the, most of the country, most people have moved away from the agrarian lifestyle and are very, uh, disconnected to where their food and their fiber, uh, comes from. And so, 
uh, here in California, there's a lot of uh, energy directed towards being very progressive on, you know, climate issues and other issues, which is all, they're all good things, um, you know, to, to, to talk about, but when the rest of your competitors aren't really focused or doing those same things, it, uh, it creates uh, challenges for us as growers. But, um, you know, I think in the long run, we'll try to continue to stand on our quality and, and uh, you know, definitely connect with um, brands and partners that need that uh, extra long staple or a unique cotton like we can grow and also want to have uh, some high level of uh, surety that uh, the products are going to be produced with, uh, you know, again, a high level of, of standards um, in terms of worker pay and environmental protection and coming from a state that uh, has a long history of uh, kind of being uh, progressive in terms of all different kinds of rights for different people and things. So anyway, it's a, it's a challenging time. You know, our our rotation is uh, 20 different crops and we're doing organic and conventional. And so when we get into these soil health discussions, um, you know, there's a lot that we're already doing because we are not um, much of a, of a monoculture. We have a, quite a diversity of crops rotating through our uh, soils. And so uh, how, how cover crops and things fit in, I know is part of the discussion with, uh, with the dry climate that we have. But um, yeah, it's been, a, been an interesting journey as a cotton producer. I'm glad we're some of the few that are left and uh, we're sort of the uh, endangered species of uh, farmers now that uh, so everybody's moved to nuts and uh, other other crops away from cotton. But um, anyway, it's certainly a wonderful crop and something we enjoy growing and something that uh, we do a good job of, of growing. So um, anyway, happy to continue the conversation. Very nice, uh, very nice introduction, all three of you. Some common themes have come up from, from each of you there. Uh, the, the utter premium and importance of water in this environment. John mentioned five inches of rainfall we get in this region. It's probably in that realm of maybe up to seven or so inches in, in a good year there. Uh, some of the labor issues were also common to, to each of you there. The, the, what you ha highlighted, Ken, and the high standards of both for, for lint quality and also the high standards that are pressured in some sense by, by regulatory uh, pressures there uh, on on farm uh, farm uh, health and and those kind of issues there are very common there. Uh, anybody else have anything that, before we move on to the soil health aspects of this? Okay, all right. Well, let's uh, we're going to involve Carrie in this next section here. I do think that uh, there. These, these are unique challenges. I think it's certainly fair to say here uh, throughout the cotton belt perhaps. And uh, it's important for our out of state uh, uh, audience here to understand some of these, these really large challenges here. What we'd like to do right now is go around the table again. And some of this might involve uh, sharing some photographs or slides that people have prepared here uh, related to some of the efforts that are underway that are directly aimed at improving uh, the health, the function of the soil resource in cotton uh, fields or farms here in California. And we, we're gonna go in the order, we'll go, John, you're gonna start off first. Can you share us some of your, your current and maybe your, your, uh, the history of soil health management from your perspective at your farm? What are you doing? So <clears throat> we have, um... Uh, worked into trying to uh, help the soil in many ways. Uh, cover crops, uh, we've been uh, composting for 30 plus years. Uh, we use the, uh, try to use the Alupki uh, style of uh, microbial uh, crumb structure. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's another thing that, a lot of these industries that we are connected with, the dairy industry, we have to have a source of manure and uh, close proximity to uh, the ranches is very important when you're sourcing uh, manure for compost. So we incorporate the compost, a lot of these uh, uh, cotton fields and our tomato fields and grains and silage corns are part of the rotation of the bigger picture of a longer looking into down one or two years to, to try to use the benefits of other crops for cotton. Um, the challenge of the cotton, it's a long season. We uh, soil prep that in the fall. It could be becoming, it could be coming back from a 
a grain crop or a tomato crop and getting that ground up and prepared and putting in it in the beds. And, and then we have a volunteer of grain on those 40 inch beds and it helps like a, a mini cover crop that we can use and we have to burn it down maybe in the spring uh, to try to conserve water after we have been pre-irrigated maybe in the winter time and hopefully we get plenty of water. So the challenges of using cover crops and cotton and it, uh, it's just like I'm beating my head on the wall all the time because it's such a challenge is what do you do with that residue if you have it in the springtime? And and it's always either going to have to shred it or disc it, but then you don't want to dis disturb the bed. So it's, you've got to try to come up with some different avenues. Do you use grains? They're more coarse. They have a higher, higher fiber content. They're harder to take, break down. The legumes seem to be much better. The clovers, the peas, the vetches uh, are, seem to be the, the answer. And so we're trying to work in, in those. They work better also on tomato beds, which is an 80 inch bed that we can manage a little bit better. It's a little, but it's a real challenge to try to figure out this a longer, like, you know, we're talking about sustainable. Cotton, is cotton gonna be sustainable in California in the future? It's very challenging. Upland cotton, the acreage is gone to hell. It's really, it is Pima. The price is there, how long the price will be, when it looks good for a year or two. It's, it's, it's those cycles that we, we're trying to prevent. And that's the challenges. But the cultural practices, we're trying to less tillage, which we know makes a difference. It's wonderful to go out in a cotton field the other day, take a shovel, stick it in that bed, and pop up three or four earthworms on conventional. So I know my compost and I know my residue breakdown is working there because these guys are working 24 seven. I don't have to pay them. So I, I'm very taken by this. And, and the rest of the, uh, of the panelists have some other ideas and uh, I'll let that go. Hey, John, very nice there. Just to fill in a couple of details okay. before we move, we move on here. You, when, what is your cover crop window? When are you seeding cover crops? And uh, do, you, what, do you do any special management with them? Is there any irrigation involved with them? Or how do you handle getting a cover crop established? Uh, it's gonna, in the fall, and it's usually around October would be, you know, the days are getting shorter, so we don't have such a, so much evaporation. To get a cover crop up, you could probably do it a minimum of six hours uh, to 12 hours sprinkling or flooded but you can get by with maybe two to three inches of sprinkling, at least get it established in those days going into November and December, and hopefully we get some rains after we pick the cotton. So that's really the, the biggest challenge, get it going and we can keep it. This year is by far the worst I've seen in several years because we had one inch and didn't have no rain for two and a half months. We have never seen that before. No, you're right. All right. Well, thank you there. That, that leads very nicely into Gary Martin. You want to share some of your experiences with uh, your efforts at soil health management, Gary? Sure. Well, they get, I've got some pictures. While they get those pictures up, we've been doing minimum till for close to 20 years. And along with that, we were doing uh, five tons of chicken manure on all the cotton ground. And we did that for 15 years and it just turned the soil into something wonderful. Uh, but then we couldn't afford the chicken manure anymore. And so we kind of quit that. And it took some years, but eventually you could see that just wear out of the soil. So then we thought we would try some uh, cover cropping, trying to get some organic matter back in it. We have a uh, some heavy clay soils, and then we have some sandy and sandy loam soils. So we were trying to cover crops on these sandy loam soils. This picture here, uh, the first year of our cover cropping, we worked the beds after cotton. And it, it's on the sand ground, it's conventional tillage. On our heavy adobe, we do our minimum till. And so this, these were new beds pulled up and then we drilled uh, 
a vetch and you know a legume radish and grain mix and kind of buried the seed in the middle of the bed and then put it in the furrows kind of nice and and then let rains bring this up the seed really didn't come up in the middle of the beds it was too deep but everywhere else it it grew fairly well um rains were kind of slow and we let it go into the springtime let it go into march trying to get more growth out of it and then it uh it was just too late to try to spray it down and do anything with it. So we got our bed disc in there and worked the green vegetation into the beds, which worked out okay because, you know, we only had ground cover on half of your field. And then we pre-irrigated that to plant our cotton. Then in the next year, we get the next slide. So after our crop, in the next year, we did our conventional tillage. We put on two tons of compost and then we left the ground flat. We land planed and then we flew our cover crop, the same cover crop on and called a pact ahead of some rains. We got good rains and then we had pretty good rains that winter and we got good ground cover. And because we had good growth, we sprayed what we thought was timely, and then disked, uh, disked it into the ground, then we pulled beds in that. And then we pre-irrigated for uh, our crop, and that worked pretty good. Uh, we, didn't, we haven't irrigated any of our cover crops. Uh, the next slide. So in the year, the fall of 19, we decided we we're gonna change our bed spacing, so we worked our ground up and we we did 38 inch beds, we typically do 40 inch bed cotton. And then we uh, flew on seed right ahead of a rain. And it was like, it was the last rain we saw. Uh, hardly grew and waited and we waited. And, and finally in the springtime, mostly what was out there were weeds. So we sprayed all that down and then we, uh, run our bed disc over it and pre-irrigated that for our cotton crop. So it was, uh, that wasn't a real good experience. You still had the same cost in your seed. We still had some expense in compost, which were all good things. Uh, if we would irrigate, I, we would have a crop. Can we go to the next slide? This is my last slide. So this year we did, uh, we undercut the cotton, and that was all the tillage we did. And then we drilled in a wheat crop into our old cotton beds. Um, of course, it's a lot more seed. And then we irrigated, uh, which is flood furrow irrigation. And uh, we got some really good growth out of it. And then we recently had that three inches of rain, which has worked out perfect. And we're, we're due for more rain or it's time to irrigate now. But... Uh, so with this experience, you know, we, we don't have a lot of weed experience. We got a lot of cotton history and it just seems like this rotation is very productive. Um, might be better than irrigating cover crops to rotate the wheat or alternate a wheat crop with more uh, composting uh, after the cotton crops. Those are kind of the thoughts we're having, but um, you know, we can sure water up a cover crop and get some growth out of it too. It's just uh, added expense. So that's kind of what we're doing now. Um, we'll go on to the next. Thank you. No, Gary, thank you very much there. Uh, for, the, for the audience and some recurring themes again, heavy on the, the lack of water there is a, a main constraint that we're, we're all facing out here. There are some excellent questions that are coming in uh, in the chat, and I want to make sure we acknowledge those. But I'll tell you what: let's let uh, Cannon and then Carrie finish this section of presentations, and then we'll we'll have them answer some of these questions. They're they're really good ones coming in. Cannon, you want to tell us a little bit about what you're up to there? 
Yeah, well, it's uh, like I said, we're constantly evolving, I think, to, to try to deal with the, the challenges out here. So when I got to the farm, we were growing uh, cotton, barley and alfalfa were the only three crops that we grew. Um, so I think our strategy then was probably much different than it is now. So I think, um, you know, the, the soil health importance has never diminished, but how we address it um, has become probably more complex, but maybe maybe easier in some ways. I mean, now we're doing some winter uh, root vegetable crops that we never had. We're doing, um, you know, a whole host of, of different, uh, our rotation is much more robust. So where we used to have, you know, cotton in a field, sometimes, you know, we would have back to back to back to back, you know, four years, even five years sometimes of following cotton and cotton. Uh, so, you know, in some ways, just having a healthy uh, number of, of crops circulating, uh, I think is, is improving soil. Uh, you know, we're seeing organic matter results uh, improving and just from the natural kind of rotation piece. And so we've always had, I just would make a note, we've had a long history of using uh, chicken manure from uh, local uh, houses that are chicken houses that are here. Um, so we've uh, factored in some of the nitrogen value from that um, and sort of that slow release uh, that it does. And then also the rice holes that uh, get incorporated to add a structure and some tilth to the soil. Um, and then we also have focused a lot on potash uh, over time. But, um, you know, we've, we've done a lot of uh, variable rate amendments, you know, looking at targeting uh, specific areas of need you know, not, not grid sampling as much as we've done uh, sort of satellite uh, imagery to look for soil uh, issues. We've targeted compost applications to some of our most uh, kind of underperforming spots and areas and fields with really poor structure. So having GIS and GPS uh, ability to kind of come back year after year and target, uh, you know, underperforming spots has been, uh, been helpful. Um, I would note that you know California uh, as a state has has been making some changes to uh, to asking uh, the urban areas to collect more green materials and at the same time they're they're asking for that green waste not to go into uh, to landfills. So I think the compost opportunity for folks in California is uh, is something that um, you know there's 15 million tons plus of, of green material annually that needs to come out of landfills and so um, i'm always looking for how farms can be uh you know a solution partner for uh for folks like the urban uh folks that we that we are neighbors with and so how do we kind of make those partnerships so you know compost could certainly be a could be a great partnership and i think you know when we talk about the experiences with cover crops and, and all that, I think it's important to note that, you know, in California, cover prop crops have a definite uh, place, but, you know, in the example of compost, we, we likely could be doing a lot better uh, by accepting compost and incorporating that potentially um, versus trying to do all that it takes. You know, Gary did a great job outlining, a, a, you know, his experience with, with cover crops, but, you um, you know the cover crop thing is difficult here and it's also just i think no matter where you are um as a as a grower you know it's a whole nother set of operations that we have to do at some point and and that's it's a it is a bandwidth issue a lot of times and then especially here if if we're going to take the time to put that seed and and we don't get the rain uh in a timely way you know we we our water costs are so high that we can't i mean I, our operation is not going to really irrigate a bunch of cover crops um you know, because of the cost of the water and availability of water. So, um, you know, the return on the investment of trying to do cover cropping here may not be as great as just doing something like being a compost partner for a municipality or something like that. So, um, you know, I think we're just constantly looking at, at trying to be creative and, and come up with, uh, with those types of ideas. I mean, if a brand or some kind of, uh, you know, sales partner wants to come to us and say, you know, hey, cover crops are part of the story we want to tell to the consumer and, and we see that, you know, there can be value. You know, somebody came to me and said, we'll pay you 15 cents a pound extra for cotton that comes off of cover crops. I mean, that allows the, that allows the grower to go back and say, okay, well, that means I'm willing to take that, that chance. And, and, you know, again, so I, I'm a person who likes the data side of things. So I'd like to see everything backed up with, 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 with science and, and proving that, you know, this cover crop is doing what it's saying, instead of just a feel good thing, I, I want to see some numbers behind it. But on the flip side of that, if a brand or some other partner wants to say, hey, this is valuable to the consumer, we think the consumer wants, you know, the idea of green on the field all year long, 
you know, then we can have that discussion, but it's got to come along with some, you know, if there is a value, the farmer needs to realize, you know, some of that value, I think. And <clears throat> I will say too, in the, uh, in the vegetable system that we have, um, you know, with the ideas of regenerative that we're talking about, and also, you know, thinking about no-till and stuff, some of the vegetable crops that we have just don't work with some of those practices, you know, some like tomatoes, trying to put them on residue sometimes may or may not work. And then incorporating animals into a system where you have food crops, where we have, uh, you know, high levels of, uh, of regulatory compliance with audits and food safety and those kind of things. You know, a lot of times um, animal manures and things like that don't work and having animals even present next to a field that you're harvesting for a food crop. I mean, there's all different kinds of, of complexities that we can get into. And so, you know, again, we have to, we kind of have to weed through the things that we can and can't do. And also just from a bandwidth perspective, like I said earlier, I think it's, it's uh, difficult to expect that farmers, you know, can go through a whole season and then do a whole nother set of, of things on top of everything else that we're trying to get done. So not that we can't make advances and do those things, but we just have to be really judicious with our time. And, you know, my hope is that, um, you know, first we can get credible data and build good data sets so that people can feel comfortable, you know, changing practices. And then uh, if there's other partners out there that, um, you know, value certain things that those folks are willing to kind of pass that value along to the grower to help that be easier because, you know, cotton has been not very profitable over these last uh, few years and margins, margins have been pretty tight. So when you're asking us to do a whole nother set of like, you know, soil practices or something else, you know, that that's just taking additional risk and you know, on a large picture thing, farmers are doing what they're doing generally because it works, you know, like we've been doing things for a long period of time. So not that we aren't always making incremental changes, but, um, you know, sometimes saying like, oh, just go do this whole new set of practices. I mean, that opens up a whole new can of risk, you know, uh, and, 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 and uh, just makes it difficult. Um, so hard to, hard to wholesale, make large changes quickly, but uh, definitely, definitely advances that we can do. So I'll stop there. Oh, very nice. And again, it's uh, you're all uh, reinforcing each other's message here. Let me sneak in a little bit of uh, Canon mentioned data and science here. We down the road from Gary and John and Canon, we've been monitoring the uh, cover crop performance for about 21 years now at a, at a university field station. And and you're absolutely right on rain-fed cover crops are largely rain-fed. The average biomass productivity is about two tons, 4,000 pounds per acre, uh, just on winter rainfall. And that, that varies from, you know, 8,000 pounds on a good, good year, four tons, down to 57 pounds per acre of dry matter on a, on a water short winter. So, so the rainfalls have been very variable here. Uh, and that's what we've, we've gotten the last 20 years on cover crop growth. Carrie Crum, you want to take it away and now share a little bit about what you've been doing, uh, with some uh, San Joaquin Valley cotton producers as well. Uh, my name is Kerry Crum. I work for the company in Madera, California called California Mom. Also the regenerative ag specialist I work with. Um, uh, uh, we've learned a lot of things that work and we've learned a lot of, about a lot of things that don't work. So uh, next slide, please. So uh, my job, my number one goal and my number one task is to minimize train wrecks with my growers. Um, as the other growers have mentioned, uh, cover cropping and system changes can create a lot of problems. Uh, one of the things that we find here in California is there's not a lot of technical service providers out there that have this kind of experience to help large growers navigate through the, the, uh, some of these practices. Um, there's a lot, a lot of these, these soil health uh, principles are, are fostered up in the uh, Northern California area on small organic uh, land holders and they just a lot of those practices, while they're, they're great, they just don't translate to large operations. So part of the process that we use for doing regenerative uh, practices uh, implementation is we, we, we want to actually maintain or increase yields. Uh, we really need to grow, insulate growers from uh, taking losses. So um, unlike the university system or NRCS, we as a company do not pay growers to implement practices. We actually have to implement them and make them money doing it. So it's a little, a little different process. Um, what the third thing we do is we take a real world application of research and theoretical ideas. We make things work. So uh, a lot of this research we utilize coming out of the Midwest with multi-species cover crops, a lot of diversity uh, really goes against what California cover cropping strategies have been with single crops or two to three things like a, 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 a vetch and oat and a pea. So uh, we're bringing mixes here that are 10, 12, 15 species. And we're seeing uh, incredible changes going on the soil much quicker with these larger diverses. 
um, uh, the way we're able to get growers to change is we have to build in incremental successes um, to, to get them to buy into changing over time. So uh, we, we can't have failures. The things that we implement has to work. And uh, if they work, uh, the grower gives us an opportunity to come back and play again the next year. Um, uh, the fifth thing we do is we design cover crop systems, not just let's go out and plant a triticale or an oat and, and, and go from there. Uh, when we put a cover crop on the ground, we want to look at the soil, soil uh, test. We want to look at the resource concerns. We want to look at the timing. We want to look at how we're going to uh, treat the cover crop, how we're going to get it germinated, how we're going to terminate it, what we're going to do with fertility in the next uh, crop to, to, to deal with what we've done uh, in the soil changes. So, um, um, I get calls all the time from growers that say, hey, I hear you guys deal in cover crop. I want to mix. And my, my, I always tell them that the, that's the last question you need to be asking. The first question is, you know, tell me about your problems and let's go from there. So next slide, please. <clears throat> so the sixth thing we do is we create a cover cropping calendar. Um, and this calendar, we, we try to get growers to plan far out, one, two, three, even up to five years. Um, uh, really, when you start implementing these system changes, planning uh, is the key to success. We just can't be willy-nilly about our decisions. Uh, these are complicated uh, production systems and uh, putting a cover crop in them really, really has the ability to make some big changes, but also creates a lot of problems. So we try to stave off the problems by uh, getting a plan together. Um, another thing we do is we teach our growers to look at their production system differently. You know, uh, I always tell growers that um, uh, uh, I always come and ask a lot of questions or not being used to, uh, used to being asked and uh, uh, it always boils down to a, a lot of decisions on the farm are based on tradition. And I always tell growers that, you know, traditions are awesome for Christmas and Thanksgiving. It can be really challenging in, with farming. To, we've got to look at innovation, uh, not so much just for the sake of change, but we've got to look at how, how can we do things better? How can we improve the soil resource? Because the soil resource is really your biggest um, uh, uh, asset. And so we've got to treat the soil better. Um, we, 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 again, going back to the planning, we have to build some short-term and long-term goals and work towards that. And, um, and, and the biggest thing with farming that, that I find to be helpful with my growers is when, when we look at production systems and we say, gosh, what, what do you want to achieve next year? And, and they'll say, well, I'm going to get five bale cotton. Okay. So that's, that's awesome. So what's your plan? Well, yeah. Maybe I can plan a better seal that down to saying, you know, we've got to make a plan. Things we're going to make and let's let's look to make those. Next slide. Um, next slide. That's just a picture of things we're able to achieve in the short term. Next slide. Uh, quick practices. We, we try to move to uh, uh, flat planning. Uh, establishing strip till um, is, is, a, is a, a new method out here that we're trying to get some success with. Till in our cover crops we want to reduce the till reduce tillage and cover crops we get uh, exponential changes um next slide um so we come in we strip till in the fall uh we put the cover crop in we bring the sheep and we uh take the sheep out we spray what's left uh we bring in a strip freshener to, to spray, and we'll come in and plant and we we overcome the nutrient tie up from the uh, added uh, crop residue um, we change the, the uh, side dress to using a rolling coulter. So when we put down nitrogen at that point, we can cut through the residue we've allowed. Uh, this system requires us to eliminate fall plow down um, to try to uh, establish the cover crop with no-till. Um, we try to get growers to uh, apply compost in addition to the sheep. And then we try to move to a sprinkled up system on the cotton to achieve a better stand. Next slide. These are some pictures of cover crop. Um, this is actually at Bulls Farming uh, on Cannon's Place. If you look uh, on the right-hand side of the picture, that's our conventional bed system. On the left-hand side of that picture is the cover crop system we have. We have left, if you can see the strips of bare soil, we've left spaces there. That's where the, that's where the fall uh, strip till strips were placed. And we're gonna come in and strip freshen those. Uh, and we should be able to miniature improve our stand. Next slide. There's another picture of that. This is what we use. Uh, we use uh, a variable rate of planters. We have the only uh, planters in the state of California with full precision planting equipment on it and also um, um, uh, two by two and, and uh, thin furrow application. We can do on a variable rate. We can do variable rate seed. Um, we use this planter uh, to do test plots. Uh, we have a we use the Orthman one tripper strip tiller. 
middle picture is a land all no-till crops and winter uh, seed now. And then the last picture on the right-hand side is the next slide. And this is my helper that helped me put together the presentation. So figured I'd throw the dog in there just so you guys get a little bit of cute, cute factor in there. Anyway, that's me and I, I uh, appreciate you guys listening to me talk. Okay, thank you. Listen, thank Carrie as well there. And uh, just for our out of state audience here, some of the things that Carrie was showing there, uh, particularly the strip till uh, uh, implement there, uh, some of the planter aftermarket technology that, that is on their planter and the use of no-till drills there. I don't want to overstate this, but uh, a lot of this stuff is pretty brand new for, for the production systems that we're talking about here in California. We haven't had the, the availability nor the familiarity with these kinds of uh, different implements uh, until the very recent uh, uh, past here. So what I'd like to do here now is before we move on, uh, let's take a look at some of the questions here. And I'll, I'll, I'm just gonna read uh, the questions that have come in, and I'd like to go in kind of a rapid fire uh, fashion here uh, between Ken and Gary, John and Carrie here. Just give us your your candid uh, first impression answers here, and we'll move on through these questions because there are quite a few here. Uh, all right, here number one: What are the toughest challenges to building soil health with the limits that you all have on water in California? You sort of talked about that already, but what comes to mind? What are the, the hard challenges you have in a nutshell? I think like John said, the cotton crop is such a long season. It doesn't, uh, doesn't give you a lot of time to do other things. Uh, you need to break that rotation up. All right. Yeah, I would just say cost and, and timing are, are big ones uh, for us, just, uh, you know, making sure we uh, are being efficient with our, our resources. But um, yeah, that's probably probably the biggest ones are just time and time and money. All right. OK, Let, let's move on to another question. Number two, over the last 40 or 50 years, uh, for all of you growing cotton there, almost there, maybe, has climate change permanently uh, made certain land in the valley out here? Unavailable, even with the best practices that are used here. You want oh, to yeah. What's again? I think this question is: Is land retirement, and is it even impossible now to grow crops in some land uh, in the valley here? No, the wet, it's the cost of water on the west side, Westlands. Uh, is you know it's very difficult to grow cotton there now. I have one ranch that our water costs went from below $100, now it's up to 150. And I have to take out alfalfa because it takes too much water and I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it in cotton. And that's happening right now. So the changes are the availability of water and the cost of it is changing the, the commodity growing because of water and, and that's gonna even increase. If we go into a drought, things change all the time. Okay. Yeah, I would say, you know, if we just, if we don't just look at water as the limiting factor, but, you know, it is a huge factor, but just climate changing, I think, is, is moving crops around. I mean, we've got garlic folks up in our area who used to be further south that are feeling like it's too hot there. I mean, for, for, <coughs> cotton, it's, for cotton itself, if you had the water thing figured out, you actually might grow more cotton in California if we had more, more heat units. So I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure we've seen a, a move away from but we're seeing shifting of crops and we're seeing, you know, with, you know, to John's point, a lot of it has to do with water, but, you know, some of it are, see, you know, performance issues based on maybe too much heat. Um, we're seeing hotter than hotter summers than, you know, record heat, you know, in the summers, we're getting four inches and five inches of rain in, in a one week period. I mean, so we're seeing all kinds of, you know, strange uh, behavior and, uh, you know, we'll just have to keep kind of following that. But I don't think at this point, I don't think there's any land that has, you know, because of like a climatic change, I mean, water supply and moving water around California are definitely constraints, but um, just from a climate aspect, I don't know that there's anything that's come out of production, but it certainly could. Okay, here's a, here's a broader uh, focus question. What do you think about the role, or what is the role for big agricultural companies? Uh, let me see, I just lost the, the uh, in supporting cotton growers and soil health efforts in California. I think this was mentioned by a couple of you earlier. Uh, 
what do you think that role, what should that look like? We're going to get to that maybe later on with Rebecca there, but what are your thoughts about that? I'll take a quick stab at it. Uh, to me, it's a lot of companies out there want to have a, a box checking exercise about what sustainability means. And, uh, you know, I think there's a plenty of very negative uh, stories out there about textiles and, and cotton in particular, how it's produced, you know, around the world and, and some of the externalities about uh, its production. So I think if companies want to source, uh, source cotton from, uh, you know, places where there's high levels of accountability and you know, make a, a traceability through the supply chain, you know, California would be a great place to start with, uh, with programs. And, you know, ultimately it's, uh, it's, you know, we don't, we don't want handouts and subsidies and those types of things. We want, um, you know, partnerships where we're recognized for the value that we bring to the table and uh, ultimately that it translates to a product that a consumer could purchase and feel really good about versus uh, a lot of the stories out there. And, and a lot of the truth about textile production is pretty, pretty ugly. Um, you know, if you look at the China situation with the Uyghurs and, you know, Uzbekistan with a lot of forced labor and all the way through the textile industry, everybody's been chasing the lowest dollar and the, you know, that's uh, not been a great outcome for the environment and for a lot of humans. And so, um, you know, there's a really uh, positive story out here in California about what we're doing. It's just, uh, you know, can we get folks to actually, uh, recognize that with their dollars and not just, uh, you know, check a, check a box and say, we've got a sustainability program. So, um, anyway, hopefully that, that can continue to happen and we can continue to explore partnerships with folks who want to tell uh, positive textile stories, which I think the world is ready for. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Ken. And there, there's, a, there's another question that came in here all the way from uh, Syria on the other side of the, the, the globe here. And it, the question comes down to uh, how difficult or, or easy is, is it to grow cover crops in an area like ours here in California with cotton. And I think we've pretty much covered that. It is challenging, I think, and I'll just summarize here quickly because of the long uh, season, the length of season of cotton uh, crop and also uh, the water shortages that are, that are very unreliable and unpredictable here. We're gonna follow up now, I think, and we'll have an open question and answer for all of our program panelists at the very end here, but we wanna move a little bit forward on the program now and follow up with that last question about what companies can do a little bit in a minute uh, with Rebecca. But before that, we'd like to introduce uh, Marsha Gibbs here. And Marsha really is, has been in the trenches uh, with uh, a, a number of San Joaquin Valley cotton farmers uh, for many, many years there. And Marsha, we'd like to turn it over to you to share a little bit about some of the history, some of the earlier efforts that have gone on in our region uh, to improve the performance of cotton production systems in general. So do you wanna tell us a little bit about that history? Uh, sure, I think um, maybe I'm, uh, maybe my screen is showing. Yeah. Yeah, okay, great. So I, I really appreciate getting the opportunity to, to talk a little bit about what uh, the Sustainable Cotton Project has done in California. Since 1996, the Sustainable Cotton Project, and we're a private nonprofit, we've been dedicated to the production and promotion of sustainably grown cotton, California cotton fiber. We've worked with innovative growers and the project helped those growers produce high quality fiber without using the most toxic pesticides and herbicides. This fiber was then made available in the market and trademarked as cleaner cotton. And across the industry, connections were made between the growers, manufacturers, and consumers to develop a cleaner cotton supply chain. So here's how it worked. SCP invited cotton growers in Fresno, Madera, and Merced counties to enroll a field in the project. Enrolled fields ranged from 75 to about 250 acres. And the growers were asked to utilize a suite of management practices and then SCP assisted them in implementing those. The project provided weekly field scouting for pests and beneficial insects, a list of chemicals to avoid based on their toxicity, direct access to University of California and other crop and industry experts, field days on pertinent topics and assistance with the marketing they grew as part of the project. Other management practices that got tried within the project included organic cotton production, colored fiber production, 
and interplanting of cotton and alfalfa. The majority of farmers found these practices effective and often they utilized the same practices on all the cotton they grew and some even on other crops they grew. Since they found that these practices didn't result in any loss of yield and in many cases they saw increased benefits. The project worked through a farmer to farmer exchange basis which allowed farmers from different areas, although they were close in geographic proximity, to get to know each other and to share information on an informal basis. They became friendly through our meetings and online connections and they learned to trust each other and discuss pertinent crop practices and facts amongst themselves. In many ways, they created a community of like-minded growers who then pooled their cotton to be, sown as clean, to be <laughs> sold as cleaner cotton through SCP's marketing efforts. So practices that were promoted through our field days, we had a dedicated project field scout and newsletters and an online blog, included again, the reduction in the use of the most toxic chemicals, which in turn allowed for more beneficial species and increased biological activity in the soil. Some, as you've already heard, reused their cotton beds from one season to another, often working in compost or manure when the beds were built and reducing tillage. We held timely field days on topics that were related to pest management, crop production, and all aspects of cotton growing and marketing. We made use of yearly petiole sampling to help growers determine more accurate use of nitrogen fertilizer and timing of applications. Our weekly field scouting by the Project Field Scout provided an online report to each grower, which not only had their scouting results, but anonymously compiled the results of all the enrolled growers. This enabled the farmers to see what was going on in the fields around them, as well as in their own. We released beneficial insects when they were needed, and we stressed the importance of crop rotation and reduced tillage to help decrease soil compaction. We provided information on the use and timing of irrigation um, and best practices to uh, protect water quality and reduction of winter runoff. One of the, uh, the trademarks, I think, of the Sustainable Cotton Project was the planting of annual hedgerows on field margins. And they attracted native bees, they enhanced pollination and natural enemies to control pests. We provided growers with the habitat seed and they could choose. Um, the seed choices included things like mustard, alyssum, corn, alfalfa, and sunflowers. We also compiled a survey at the year's end to kind of catalog what best management practices growers had implemented and also included yield results to see how the practices uh, played out in, in actual growing season. But along with the production assistance, the project also worked on the marketing side to promote the use of cleaner cotton that the growers produced and to provide them for a reward in the marketplace for making changes at the farm level. This fiber was presented to brands and companies by SCP, but was actually sold then through traditional channels with a suggested 10 to 15 cent per pound premium that went directly to the grower. So as we look back, uh, SCP was originally founded again back in 1996. And the original intent was to help California farmers who were working in intensive systems of cotton cultivation to transition to organic. So the questions we were asking at that point were, how can we reduce chemical use on cotton and bring a premium to small family farmers for their efforts to make a change? We worked with UC crop and extension experts to bring their research to a larger scale in the fields with family farmers. We developed pioneering farm tours, bringing activists, members of the public, students, and industry representatives into the field to meet with our farmers, with scientists, and even local doctors to help understand the challenges of organic production and work together for change, and breaking through that somewhat polarized language that went, uh, went along with activism. 
Over the years, the tours were sponsored by many brands, including Patagonia, Levi, Nike, Gap, Ikea, American Apparel. And we influenced scores of companies to adopt organic programs. Companies that included Esprit, Eileen Fisher, Mountain Equipment Co-op, Hannah Anderson, REI, Timberland, Marks and Spencer, and including Patagonia, whom we ran personalized tours for, taking their salespeople, designers, and buyers on private cotton tours. And it was on an SCP tour that Patagonia's Yvonne Chenard decided to switch all their cotton products to organic. We also presented to small brands and textile companies translating scientific information from the field work into visual and actionable forms and helping companies think through their organic cotton strategies. In the late 90s, however, as we all know, NAFTA and China joining the World Trade Organization um, forced US textile sourcing to move overseas due to low cost and so went most of the organic cotton production. Organic cotton production moved largely to regions that were labor intensive, not just chemical intensive. And they moved for price parity and not really as a tool for changing cotton cultivation. Over the years, the production of organic remains at less than 1% of global cotton production. It doesn't use harmful chemicals, but it certainly has not been an effective tool for creating global cultural change. Unable to compete with the overseas labor costs, brands could not pay the cost of organic uh, or would not uh, pay the cost of organic production in California. Several SCP growers tried organic and found it was not workable on many levels, the cost of production being the biggest factor. So SCP then asked what tools could be more effective to influence cotton cultivation. And so we then pivoted to market the cleaner cotton and encouraged by farmers like John Texera and Gary Martin, both on this call today. They were aware of the field work SCP was doing and how it could benefit local growers. Farmers enrolled with SCP agreed that getting a small price increase for making beneficial changes to farming practices and promoting sustainability on the farm level was exciting. They welcomed a chance to showcase their quality farming, but then we had to figure out a way to make it work. Tuscarora Yarns industry veteran Peter Hegarty, who is a, col a colleague of um, SCP's marketing director, Linda Gross, connected SCP with Hill Spinning Mill in North Carolina. Hill was willing to spin small amounts of fiber and keep them separated, which would allow for a traceable sale of cleaner cotton through the spinning process. We sold cleaner cotton to American Apparel, but recognized that most brand timelines were disconnected from how cotton is cultivated and its timeline. So SCP ended up purchasing cotton from our own farmers and shipped it to Hill Spinning in North Carolina to be ready for brand requests for cleaner cotton fiber. We recommended this fiber to Lydia Went of California Cloth Foundry who developed the backyard hoodie, which was 17% colored cotton and 73% cleaner cotton. This resulted in one high visibility project, the, the North Face hoodie, but the fiber was used by other manufacturers as well and could always be linked back to the individual farmer who produced the cotton. SCP also helped retailers by supplying marketing information on how the fiber was grown and who the farmers were. We provided cotton for yarn companies, Quince & Co and Lunatic Fringe. We supported the education of new designers through cotton tours for fashion colleges in California, including California College of the Arts, Otis College of Art and Design and Woodbury University. And our farmers and UC scientists continue to be an integral part of the fashion and sustainability curricula at California College of the Arts. The market interest in sustainable cotton, whether that's organic, better cotton initiative, cleaner or regenerative, waxes and wanes. But once SCP's farmers noticed beneficials in the field they never knew they had, we knew that the field work of SCP had created a deep cultural shift that was indeed here to stay, independent of markets and products. 
So I'm happy to be here today with some of these pioneering farmers and thank you for this opportunity to share a little bit about SCP's history. Marsha, we want to thank you very much uh, on behalf of all of us here for, for sharing that uh, truly groundbreaking retrospective there. And it, it has integrated a number of the underlying themes, I think, that have come up throughout the morning here uh, that, that are very important. And, and we, we appreciate your, your summary of that history there. It also now, uh, for our audience here, it very nicely leads into our our last formal individual speaker this morning, our presenter, and that is Rebecca Burgess. Rebecca is with Fibershed and she probably is known to many of you on the call this uh, today. I just wanna recall in, in introducing her uh, with one last uh, word here. She once in one of our planning meetings for today's uh, showcase event, she used the phrase negotiating brand scenarios uh, that are gonna be workable for, for all parties, uh, the farmers, the brand buyers and everyone. And you, you shared a little bit about that pioneering, pioneering work that you were involved with, uh, Marsha. But let's hear now from Rebecca about where, where we are right now. Where is the state of, of uh, the industry with respect to uh, those relationships and those negotiations? Rebecca, do you want to take it over? Yes, thank you, Jeff. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen if that's okay. Um, all right. Um, well, I just wanted to, to thank everyone who's spoken thus far. It's been great to collaborate also with everyone who's spoken thus far. And some of our collaborations are deepening um, as this work uh, launches. So I just wanted to frame Fiber Shed's work started really in rangeland and wool systems. And we, um, we did work on, um, Marcia mentioned the backyard project. Our colleague Dan DeSanto um, did the zero fallout pattern for that. And we definitely got involved with the North Face at that time. But then we jettisoned to wool systems. I will say that that we, we've worked in those systems and looked at ways to increase photosynthetic carbon capture on those ranches and farms. And so a lot of our brand relationships were forged in, in that system. Um, um, Fibershed works at a regional level. We, we really attempt to regionalize the relationships between farmer and wearer. Um, and also we work, we have something called the Regional Fiber Manufacturing Initiative, a program area that um, focuses on developing and incubating manufacturing entrepreneurs and putting hopefully manufacturing systems that can regionalize the value added aspect of our work on the ground here. So th that's just a little bit of meta context. You know, we started in rangelands and wool. We were looking at soil carbon and measurements and we pioneered this idea of the insetting back in 2008, how you could look at your supply chain as the place where you can do good instead of looking at another part of the world's ecosystems as a place to divert your corporate social responsibility dollars, but how do you internalize your corporate social responsibility dollars into your supply chain? And we saw some early stage investments by brands at the VF Corp in the sheep ranches. They literally paid for the compost pad. They paid for some of the compost making. Um, they helped some of the ranches go to a place where they were ending up finding themselves in a place they could certify organic. So in, um, so cotton, you know, Marsha and Linda are, are leaders and um, they are the leaders in this work of cotton in California. Um, Fibershed was just, was asked to look at researching this space a little bit more. So we, we ended up with a, a grant from the Marciano Foundation, which was presented on, on, the, last, um, on the last webinar that the Soil Health Institute hosted. We received a grant that company, um, the Guest Jeans Company, is owned by the Marciano family. They are not using right now regenerative cotton, organic cotton. What they're looking at was how can we just help shift systems? But they haven't yet internalized all of the 
goals they have with their foundation, with their company, like they're, they're working out how to make a product and that that will take more time. So in the meantime, there's research occurring um, and it's um, currently occurring at Bulls Farm. Um, Canon and Derek have been incredibly gracious. Carrie Crum is the technical service provider. The primary investig investigator is Dr. Cindy Daly um, with in involvement from um, Tim LaSalle and, and David Johnson. And that research is a 64 acre trial site. Um, you know, Canon can speak more and Carrie can speak more to what's going on to, to understand what's being tested on that research site. But I wanted to just focus on why it becomes so complicated <laughs> to build these markets. So in our regional fiber manufacturing initiative, you know, uh, Marcia said this very eloquently around NAFTA and CAFTA and all of the other trade agreements, <laughs> the offshoring of the industry has made the utilization of California and domestic cotton, not always a simple plug and play system for, for, for large brands. They, they see their supply chain is really overseas and how would we move this cotton overseas and the supply chain ecosystem isn't really functioning in the US, they think. So um, we just analyzed the Western US, this graphic is from last year. If you look at the cotton side, um, when, when we did this analysis, you can see that the, the ginning, of course, we have in place, um, many of you, um, the growers on the call are involved in either the cooperative ownership of a gin, and there are privately owned gins in California. Um, but when you get to the opening, the carding, um, the drawing, the combing, the spinning, all of those systems are, are not here. Um, and so uh, that's just a reality when you're trying to get the brands to, to understand how to engage, you have to be able to give them a supply chain. It's not just selling regenerative cotton or organic cotton, you actually have to set up price competitive supply chains, <laughs> which is the, the first, that phrase price competitive is a little bit hard, um, but, but doable at scale, at the right scale. So um, here's uh, Carrie and Derek at Bulls Farm. Um, this was a day where Chico State was uh, um, inoculating the cover crop seed. Carrie showed a picture of that cover crop at Bulls. Um, these, are, these are brand leaders. Um, this is, um, you see, Mate the Label, Koyuchi. Um, Lauren Tucker from Kiss the Ground is a partner in this work, and so is um, Lauren Bright, uh, who is from Gap Inc. and Crystal um, Wood Moody, who is an innovative leader from VF Corp. We have the large corp uh, textile developers on the team, but we're working with California headquartered brands. And what we're trying to do is marry the research that's happening and the yield that will come off those fields with a higher uh, value set of supply chains with California based brands. We're really interested again in those relationships between the California headquartered brands and the farmland in our community. So, um, he, you know, this is a, a COVID tour. Um, we were all, it's a, it's a little awkward, <laughs> but it was done successfully where soil samples were taken, cover crop seed was inoculated um, with a fungal dominated compost. And um, again, I'm gonna focus on why, a little bit of the backbone of how you, how you get these incentives at the field level or at the lint level to work, like you can, brands are excited. They're, you know, they're looking at, okay, 250 a pound, economically model that for us, Fibershed. So we do, and we, we do a lot of analysis on, so we interviewed in, for this one project where we have five, five California headquartered brands, we interviewed and cataloged information from 20 domestic vendors. This is what Crystal and Lauren do. They're, they're hired by, uh, as consultants by our nonprofit. They've retrieved ballpark pricing for these kinds of yarns. We modeled everything at 250 a pound. Um, we went to the six different fabric mills. Um, we took the cotton specs that um, we have from the seed varietal that we think will be best adapted for a, a slightly um, later planting date. So it's not an extra long staple cotton we're looking at. It's, it's, a, it's a long, longer staple, <laughs> Akela, <laughs> um, to work with the cover crop work that's being done in field. Um, we developed a, a master uh, fabric data sheet. This is again work that Crystal and Lauren did with all of the pricing, the timing, right? Mar Marcia brought this up. How do you get the brands to understand the harvest to the finished product? How does it work with their production, sales calendars, all of that? 
So all of that has to be mapped and that's, that's what we are focused on. Um, and so that's what the phase one development summary did. So this was from dis end of November until about February 5th, we were doing this work on this slide. And then we did some farm to yarn yield. So when you talk to the mills in the US, you have to say, we're gonna nominate a cotton source. We're not going to ask the mill to just purchase from distributors. We're gonna nominate this cotton up into the supply chain at this 250 a pound. When you do that, you have losses sometimes that because the mill's not purchasing just what they need for that yarn spec, you're kind of saying, you're gonna use this lint. <laughs> And so these circles on the left side that you see here, this is kind of the losses that we're anticipating um, from a, a ring spun cotton development project. Now there's, if you, those of you who know, there's open spinning and ring spinning. And the brands who, do, who develop higher quality heirloom textile would like ring spun. It, it's a higher quality cotton that creates a longer term uh, duration of, of textile, meaning it'll live longer. So right here in that ring spun system, we were looking at a 43% loss by the time we got to, um, to yarn. And so you start with this outer circle at the gin and then, oops, and then here's what you end up with. So <clears throat> we saw this loss ratio and we thought, huh, can we go farther? And can we design a textile where we bring that loss ratio closer to our end product. So this circle, this is what Lauren Bright developed. Um, and I'm sorry, Crystal and Lauren aren't here to present their work because it's beautifully done, I think, in this graphic. They're showing the, the loss ratio is changing here when we think about developing a specified fabric. So they developed a fabric that would utilize everything from, or more so from the field. Um, so what that means is how do you combine the open spun and the ring spun? How do you make the minimums on those two yarn specs and then combine these two yarn specs into an heirloom quality textile using only the American manufacturing systems that have their own opportunities, but a lot of constraints. So um, it's been an exquisite puzzle. I mean, really, it's a puzzle. It's, it's, a, it's an art and a science to do this work, to really get this costing to land. Um, for those of you in the who are you know the grower side or, or the farm TA side, one thing I just I think it's important to remember is a lot of the brands don't have textile developers on staff. So when they they'll buy a bolt of fabric, and maybe they don't even buy the bolt, maybe they'll just go to a cut and sew operator and they'll see some samples, and they might send a CAD pack off and say, "This is our technical package. This is what we want you to make." And they don't often have any real touch point with even the knitter, the weaver, the spinner, the farmer. And they won't actually, in many cases, know how to make a textile. So even though they sell textiles, they don't often know how to make them. Some of the larger brands have that built in, but most brands are not, they don't have that built in. Some do, some, but most don't. <laughs> I wanna give credit to those who do, but it's, a, it's, a, it's not a large uh, percentage. So that's why we're doing this work, because if we're going to stabilize higher pricing, we have to be committed to also developing the textile itself and making sure that the whole system works soup to nuts. Um, and then this is a picture Cannon took of his field. This is the research plot, um, the collaboration between Cary and Bowles and CSU and Fiber Shed, um, where you see the conventional um, plots compared to these green plots. Now I will say the brands are, and we all get really excited with green. I know Canon, you mentioned green being kind of maybe a box checker, um, but I see that as photosynthetic carbon capture. And I know there's water costs and there's energy costs to moving that water. Um, but I thought it was really a beautiful image that you took. And it really shows, you know, if, if we got enough rain, maybe it's those years we get enough rainfall that cover crops are viable. And maybe it's the years when we're not getting rain, we use the compost from um, the urban uh, green waste centers. And we combine strategies and we're flexing based on what's real. So um, just wanted to say that we're, we're with the brands, I'll go back to the brands for one last statement and say, we're in what we call phase 1.5. Jeff, I'd hoped we were in phase two today. So I'm treading water a little because we went to the brands and we gave them how much yield we want them to uptake and the price. 
not a problem. They want all of it. <laughs> the question though is, do they want this particular fabric? Because that idea of being pre-competitive um, really requires that they go over these minimum hurdles as a team. So to agree on these things as a team is um, where we're flushing out some details. I think though, what's beautiful though, is their commitment. They wanna walk down the path with the growers. Um, you know, they're saying, we know this is a small project now and we wanna bring more brands to the table. We wanna see the price of cotton increase. We can afford this if we do this together. If they do it alone, they can't afford it. So that's what's exciting is if we can get these brands to work together and they can get their agreements set up, which they are doing, it's just, it's quite a, it's quite a journey, but it, they're doing it. And that way I could see the future of, of higher priced cotton with a real supply chain set of partnerships. I mean, the mills are, are our partners. The brands are our partners. We kind of have to grow our ecosystem of partnerships, I think, um, as we continue this work to, to create these domestic homegrown textiles. All right, I'll stop there. <laughs> Rebecca, thank you very much. And before you stop sharing the screen, can you share just explain that uh, that picture there? What are we seeing? The green is what, and the brown dark bands are what? And then I have a question for you. Okay, so um, the dark bands, I think that that explains what is would normally occur um, in at this winter time of year, where cotton um, would would be planted perhaps you know early March to mid March. Um, and then Canon, I don't know if you're on mute, if you wanna jump in here too. Um, and Carrie, if you'd like to jump in, Carrie actually, um, per, this is you know obviously Canon's photo and then Carrie developed the, the seed mix and Canon and team and Carrie planted it. Do you wanna to speak to the seed mix that you're working with? The green, this is in a, in a cover crop situation there. The green is the cover crop, right Canon? Yeah, the green is the cover crop and the, and the open ground is, shows up just as that darker. Uh, All right. Okay. I uh, listen, Rebecca. That that was very very fascinating and truly uh, uh, groundbreaking. Again, as well, there we're we're grateful for that. And just for our broader audience, the reason we we tried to have a broad perspective on our our showcase this morning is because uh, this this is all related. All of these things: the production, the farming practices, the soil health approaches here. And the uh, the eventual sale of cotton, as you heard from many people this morning, it's all it's all bundled together in in a, in a in a farm system there. So we're grateful for all the perspectives that have been shared here. There are I'm tempted to let's let's stop the sharing there and let's let's handle uh, David if we can give us a few more minutes uh, to handle some of the questions here. I'll just read them off right now from my screen, and then I'll ask anybody from our our program team here to, to weigh in as they see fit here. Uh, first question comes in, how can I get one of those shirts? I'm not exactly sure which shirt that was there, but if anybody showed a picture of a shirt, uh, uh, we'll save that question there, Shelly and, uh, uh, and Connor there. Number two here, how do you balance issues of soil loss, like wind loss, wind erosion there, with the cost of keeping soils and cover crops? Somebody, maybe one of the farmers want to handle the question of erosion and how that that may or may not factor into your farming systems here. You know, Jeff Bissigari, I think I'd probably have more drainage soil loss than wind loss, you know, when we flood irrigate. That really moves dirt. Um, we, we just don't deal with soil losses like that from the wind. Yeah. John or Cannon, you have anything to add? Uh, I agree with uh, Gary. Uh, flood irrigation is, uh, you know, keep it your field level and uh, how you regulate your water. But yeah, something on the drain side, it's, it's, if, it's, if you can get that compost in there and try to create more of a glue effect in the soil, uh, that might hold it a little bit, but you know, it's, it's uh, gravity, water moves to moves. All right, very good here. Uh, the next to last question here is uh, related to trap cropping. Does alfalfa, does that serve as a trap cot, a crop in cotton systems? Anybody want to talk about that? 
Yeah, it does. It does. And it has for many years. Um, it, uh, it definitely is, it can be a sink for, uh, for Ligus and other things. So, um, you know, but uh, unfortunately, the dairy uh, economics out here have made uh, a lot of those alfalfa and also just the, some of the water requirements, uh, just the, the competitiveness of alfalfa has diminished as these uh, uh, nutritionists in the dairies have figured out how to blend and feed uh, and get alfalfa out of the ration. So unfortunately, it's hard to, to maintain that as a, uh, as a trap crop. Very good, Darren. Uh, the, the last question before we do a wrap up here, uh, David, here is, let me just read this one here. As we know about the effect of herbicides, I am concerned that some crops would be sensitive to use as cover crops because of herbicide residues. What should we do to manage them? So I guess this is talking about uh, uh, sensitivity that might be carried over there. Anybody want to take a stab at that one? Um, we, is that is that a question for Carrie? It could be. It. I mean, anybody. Yeah, open open ended, Carrie. Uh, so from my experience, uh, we typically don't have much of a problem with carryover the, the the only thing that we uh we do see some sensitivity we have to pay attention a little bit to uh, plant back restrictions on some of the later season herbicides so that can impact a little bit of the um of the germination on some of the cover crop species but if we have enough space between the herbicide in season and the cover crop in the fall we typically don't see a problem all right very good the only thing I would add is that, you know, on the termination of the cover crop, you know, there's been some, you know, depending on timing, some want to use, you know, like a glyphosate to, to shut down a, a cover crop. But um, certainly with the focus on glyphosate, depending on if you are trying to work with a brand or partner, uh, regardless, I guess, how we feel about it being uh, scientifically proven or not, the perception is definitely fair or definitely there's a perception about uh, wanting less glyphosate in our systems. And so, um, you know, I think uh, we take that into account with uh, also how we're going to terminate uh, cover crops. And uh, again, that's just part of these ongoing discussions that there's there's a lot of uh, push and pull between science and perception out there. Well, very good. Listen, on behalf of uh, our entire program group, I want to wrap this up now. And, and once again, uh, thanks to all of the participants here who joined us today. In our audience, thanks to the Soil Health Institute for their, their tremendous uh, encouragement and support here to, to pull this uh, showcase off here. I just, I, I guess I'll leave you, leave you with a few uh, maybe notes that I took here. We tried to share with you lots of the, the challenges that uh, cotton production faces out here in California. A second theme that came out uh, loud and clear was the very high standards that uh, people have here not only for the lint or the quality of the cotton that's produced, but the farming practices and the systems of production that are in place uh, in this, this region here that, that I think are rightfully, folks are very proud of. We talked about an array of soil health management approaches and some of the constraints that uh, limit some of those being implemented more widely and what is being looked at uh, economically. And then lastly, we heard uh, very nicely about the utter complexity and the, uh, the, the puzzling nature of uh, uh, some very creative work that's underway to, to match uh, the buyers with uh, the cotton producers here. So with that, David, I'll turn it back to you and we thank uh, uh, our program team here uh, for, for sharing their insights this morning as well. David? Thank, thank you, Jeff, and I appreciate your uh, the complexity there, it's always amazing to me uh, when you're here from different parts of the country, the challenge that you had. And I think the takeaway I got is that you, you can't take what works uh, individually or on an individual field, maybe in North Carolina, or Arkansas, and, and apply it in Texas or certainly not there in California. So soil health is, is a site-specific. The principles may be kind of universal, but it is site-specific. So with that, I just want to invite folks uh, next week, we'll be hearing from the other side of the country, Georgia, and listening to a little bit about how soil health can be managed in a cotton and peanut production system. 
And again, I appreciate Jeff and all the speakers today. And with that, I'll say goodbye and everybody have a good week. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.